Let's switch things up a bit and talk about the U.S. Army Special Forces, otherwise known as the Green Berets. Of course, this is done strictly for entertainment or educational purposes. There's a lot to cover here, so we probably omitted some of it. But if this perks your interest and you're interested in trying something like this, we encourage you to do your own research and post a video. Now, why are we talking about the Special Forces? I think too often the terms like Spec Ops or Special Forces or Special Operations are used interchangeably and usually incorrectly to describe our elite military units. So in this video, we hope to describe the U.S. Army Special Forces for everyone. Now, if I had to use one word to describe a Green Beret, I'd use teacher. Their job is to go behind enemy lines and teach both civilians and soldiers in third world nations how to resist their oppressors. Now they're given a unique job to do and they do it in a unique way. Unlike typical conventional forces which will come in great numbers with typically a lot of support, uh, Green Berets go out in 12-man teams behind enemy lines uh, unsupported and teach the indigenous populations how to resist. Now we'll talk more about unconventional warfare here in a moment. But to put it in perspective, we only have about 14,000 Green Berets. They make up about 25% of our special operations forces. But to put that in perspective, since 2001, over 50% of our casualties have been Green Berets. Now we said that their number one task is unconventional warfare, sometimes called guerrilla warfare. I think a great, good definition of this would be the attempt of military victory through indigenous peoples who are supported, trained, and organized by an external source. So if you think about the French resistance to the Nazis during World War II, where the special forces get their roots, um, that's the kind of job that they're tasked to do. Guerrilla warfare, subversion, and sabotage with the indigenous forces available. To them. Now, uh, because they're behind enemy lines, they're often also tasked with intelligence as well. So in this video, we're going to take a look at a lot of different aspects of the Green Berets. But I hope that this, again, sparks someone else to maybe do a video like this about a, an elite military unit they're interested in. I think a good place to start talking about the Green Berets is with their mission. Now, it's grown over time, but their number one mission has always been unconventional warfare, along with foreign internal defense, teaching uh, internal uh, people how to defend themselves. And because they're war fighters, they're occasionally called to direct action. Uh, they're elite forces, so they're responsible for counterinsurgency as well as special reconnaissance. And again, we'll talk about uh, where they get their roots and you'll, that's why that's evident. Uh, more recently, they're also involved with counterterrorism as well as the counterproliferation proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and they've always been tasked with information operations or what used to be called PSYOPs, given accurate and inaccurate information where necessary. Now the special forces get their roots from the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which was one of the predecessors of the CIA. Their job during World War II was to gather intelligence, conduct operations behind enemy lines, and support the resistance groups in the various theaters. They did this through the use of small operational groups called Jedberg teams. The first special service force was a group of Canadians and Americans that, that mastered uh, this type of uh, task. Now, after World War II, uh, the remnants of the OSS uh, came back and decided that we needed a, a place to train uh, for special warfare like this. Uh, they created the uh, Special Operations Warfare Center, and soon after uh, the, the first special forces were established, uh, they were soon transferred or deployed. More special forces groups were created and also deployed. And by the time we got to Vietnam, uh, special forces had already been out doing their work all around the world. Now, during Vietnam is where the special operations really proved their worth. Uh, their job was similar. They were tasked with the similar jobs as the similar responsibilities as the OSS had during World War II, uh, as far as strategic reconnaissance, capture of enemy prisoners, rescuing downed pilots, rescuing our prisoners of war, as well, as well as all the clandestine and psychological operations. Now this wasn't just the Green Berets, of course, just the SEALs, the CIA, and force reconnaissance from the Marines were also involved, but again, this is where Spec Ops really proved its worth uh, during uh, fighting. And after Vietnam, until the present time, uh, you know, things have changed, but I think the next progression here is to talk about what special forces or what the Green Berets are not. Uh, special operations is a kind of a vague term, and I think when most people think special operations, or when they say special operations, they're thinking 
of the well, what's most recent incarnation, the U.S. Special Operations Command. It's a very large division of our Department of Defense. In fact, it's as large as the Army, Navy, or Air Force as far as its hierarchy, as far as number of people, of course, it's tiny. Uh, but basically, since World War II and through Vietnam and through the 80s, uh, different reasons, uh, the chain of command has changed. And currently, spec, uh, U.S. Special Operations Command is in charge of the special operations units from the various branches. So from the Army, they get the Rangers and Special Forces and the uh, Special Operations Aviation, as well as PSYOPs and the Special Warfare Center. From the Navy, they get the SEAL teams. Uh, from the Marines, they get MARSOC. And from the, Air Soft, or from the Air Force, they get the Pathfinders and Pararescue. Uh, they also are in uh, oversight of uh, Delta Force and SEAL Team 6, our counter-terrorist uh, units. So this is the hierarchy now. Of course, this has changed over time. Uh, but again, what we're really talking about here is Special Forces. And I just wanted to give you this description to show you that Special Forces is one little piece of the, of the overall Special Operations, what most people are talking about. So when we talk, uh, let's give you a little bit more about the organization of Special Forces. For anybody that's interested, we've got U.S. Special Operations Command, like we showed. Uh, if you go down into the Army, U.S. Special Forces Command is in charge of more than just the Special Forces, these other uh, divisions as well. But as far as the Special Forces go, uh, they've got five active Special Forces groups and two National Guard groups. So let's take a closer look at those groups. Uh, this is the main organizational level of the Special Forces units. So uh, each group gets a headquarters company as well as a support company, and then it has three battalions, well, three or four battalions. Each battalion has a headquarters and a support company and then three companies. Those companies each have six A teams and a B team, and each of those A teams has 12 Green Berets. So that's it's the overall uh, structure of the Special Forces groups. Now let's take a look at that A-team, the, the Operational Detachment Alpha. This is the core of the Special Forces. Again, it was developed back in World War II. The idea is that, as, in, as opposed to an individual spy who doesn't wear a uniform and goes behind enemy lines, and also opposed to a conventional force who would wear a uniform but come in great numbers with a lot of uh, support behind them. The A team will go behind enemy lines as a uniformed group, uh, but self-sustained. And because of that, they have overlapping specialties. A lot of people are familiar with this. I won't go too into it. But of course, they have their their leadership. They have their medical. They have their weapons, communications, and then engineers. Their job is to go behind enemy lines and be self-sufficient. And that's again, there's been lots of talk about this, but this is the core of the special forces. Now, because of that, there's only certain jobs you can do in the Special Forces. They're not easy jobs to do, and uh, we'll list them here. But again, this is just to give people an idea of uh, what it takes or what's it, it, the process of becoming a, a Green Beret. Now, the, the Green Beret is uh, someone who's passed the qualification or the Special Forces qualification course, technically. And that's a long school, between 50 and 95 weeks. Uh, the box of instruction will cover various skills and things that they're going to need. Uh, again, uh, typically the special forces are going to uh, altogether uh, speak more than 15 languages, uh, be familiar with the culture in over 130 countries, and be ready to you know go out and do jobs in multiple areas of operation. So let's go back to the groups, and you can see that each of the groups has its distinctive insignia. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the groups are located in various parts around the country. So once you're a Green Beret, you get uh, stationed at one of the various groups. Those groups are responsible for areas of operations around the world. So let's take a look at a world map, and you can see that the various groups are tasked with various areas of operation where they're needed. Now let's take a look at how you can recognize uh, a Green Beret. Uh, that's with their insignia, like any, or at least any Army unit. And uh, we'll talk about their shoulder insignia, their crest, their beret flash, and then their tab. So the shoulder tab was approved in 1955. It's gold and blue, which is assigned to units that are outside the standard Army, Navy, and uh, Air Force. Its upturned dagger represents the knife that was used by the oper operators in the OSS during World War II. The three bolts of lightning represent their uh, unconventional warfare as well as the ability to strike by air, water, and land. The arrowhead shape 
comes from the first special service force which come which took it from the native american warriors who inspired their patch and you can see the arrowhead or the spear point in most special operations patches that come from that history now the special forces crest was approved in 1960 it's two silver arrows with a cross dagger uh, surrounded by a black ribbon with their motto and the uh, cross arrows come from back in 1890 when, it, when, the, when that was the official insignia for the US Army Indian Scouts that was adopted again by the first special service force and then adopted into the special forces crest the dagger of course uh, comes again from the dagger that was issued to the OSS guys in World War II the motto Dio Presso Liber again harks back to the mission to free the oppressed the Special Forces tab is a school qualification tab as opposed to a unit tab like Airborne, uh, which can also be a qualification tab. Uh, well, it can be a qualification. Uh, the tab was created in 1983. Again, it's an individual tab as opposed to a unit tab. So uh, once a person is out of a Special Forces unit, they can still wear their tab. Now, the tab takes precedence over any others. So It'll go over a ranger tab, a sapper tab, or the presidential top 100 fitness thing. So uh, again, it's an individual tab, so it'll also go over a unit tab. It's only awarded to individuals completing the Q course. Uh, so that's, I, I should mention, uh, that's also the way you can tell if someone's actually a Green Beret or one of their uh, people in one of their support units. Uh, the Green Beret itself, I could probably do an entire video on, but this one's getting kind of lengthy, so I'll quickly say that it was first unofficially adopted in 1954. Uh, they picked the green color uh, as a uh, respect to the British commandos of World War II. Uh, it wasn't until 1961 that Ken President Kennedy uh, designated the Green Beret as the exclusive headdress of the U.S. Army Special Forces. And again, there's lots to talk about with the Green Beret. It could get its own video, but that's again a way to recognize the actual Green Berets. Uh, the Special Forces have been represented in culture a couple of times. Of course, my, one of my favorite movies is The Green Berets with John Wayne. Uh, probably the best one. Uh, First Blood's a neat movie. Uh, probably not the best representation of a Green Beret. And then we get the A Team. But uh, there's probably lots of other ones out there, but these are the three that usually come to mind when people think Green Beret. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to post a video like this, because they often are uh, um, not going to pat themselves on the back. I'm going to leave you with the Special Forces Creed that you can read on your own. And uh, again, uh, thanks to all the guys that have served. Uh, they won't talk about it. You t your people talk about their uh, exploits, and very rarely do you hear Green Beret, you know, find out they're Green Berets. Green Berets do not typically talk about what they do, not only because it's clandestine, uh, but also because, again, they're uh, called quiet professionals for a reason. So, all the respect that's due to them. Uh, we like to uh, suggest you take a look at some of these links. It's where we got the information for this video. For our organizations out there that support the Green Berets, we encourage you to support them, as well as the organizations that support our freedom. We post information like this on our websites. We thank you for your support. And as always, thanks for watching.